This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Warlord of Kor by Terry Carr Chapter 10 Wearily, Ryanson switched off the interpreter, leaving the wires still connected to the alien. He walked through the faintly echoing, dust-filled temple and stepped out onto the colonnade around it. It was almost dark now. The deep blue of the Herlogy sky had turned almost black, and the pinpoint lights of the stars broke through. The wind was rising from the flat. It caught his hair and whipped it roughly around his head. He looked up at the emerging stars, remembering the day when Harun had suddenly, inexplicably, stood and walked to the base of a broken staircase. He had looked up those stairs, past where they had broken and fallen, past the shattered roof to the sky. The Herlogy had never reached the stars, but they might have. It had taken a god, or a jumbled legacy, from an older, greater race to forestall them, and now all they had was the dust and the wind. Ranson could hear the rising moan of that wind gathering itself around him building to a wailing planet dirge among the columns of the temple. And inside, the Herlogy were dying. The knives and bludgeons of the earth mob outside would only complete the job. The Herlogy were too tired to live. They dreamed dimly under the shadowed foreheads, dreamed of the past, and sometimes, perhaps, of the stars. Behind the altar, the huge and intricate mass of alien circuits glowed and clicked and pulsated, slowly, seemingly at random, but steadily. The brain must be self-perpetuating to have lasted this long, feeding its energy cells from some power source Ryanson could only guess at, and repairing its time-worn linkages when necessary. In its memory banks was stored the science of a race which had preceded even the ancient Herlogy. The outsiders had sprung up when this planet was young, had fought their way to the stars and galaxies, and eventually, when eons of time passed down, had pulled in their outpost and fallen back to this world. And they had died here, on this world, falling to dust which was ground under by the grey race which had followed them to dominance. Before time, Harung had said, that must have meant before the Herlogy had developed telepathy before the period covered by the race memory. But the outsiders were still here, alive in that huge alien brain, the science, the knowledge, the strange arts of a race which had conquered the stars while men still wondered about the magic of lightning and fire. A science was encapsulated here which could speak of war and curiosity as discontent, but could say nothing definite of contentment an incomplete science? A merely alien science? Ryanson didn't know. And the Herlogy, twenty-six of their race remained, dreaming under heavy domes through which the stars shone at night and silhouetted the worn edges of broken stone. Twenty-six grey, hopeless beings who had not even been waiting, and the Earthmen had come. For a moment, Ryanson wondered if the Herlogy did not perhaps carry a message for the Earthmen too, that decadence was the price of peace, death the inevitable end of contentment. The Herlogy had stilled themselves, back in the grey past, had taken their measure of quiet and contentment for thousands of years, the searching drives of their race dying within them, and this was their end. There is no purpose. Ranson shook himself and felt the cold wind cut through his clothing. It reawakened him. Stooping, he gathered up several of the disintegrators and brought them with him to the head of the mass of stairs up which the attackers must come. He crouched beside those stairs, watching for movement below, but he couldn't see anything. Something about the Herlogy still bothered him. Kneeling in the gathering darkness, he finally isolated it in his mind. It was their hopelessness the numbness that had crept over them through the centuries. No purpose. But they had lived in peace for thousands of years, 
No, their death was not merely one of decadence. It was suffocation. They had not chosen peace. It had been thrust upon them. The herlogy had been at the height of their power, their growth still gathering momentum, and they had to stifle it. The end in view didn't really matter. It had not been what they would have chosen, and, having had peace forced upon them before they had been ready for it, they had been unable to enjoy it, and the stifling of scientific curiosity that had been necessary to complete the suppression of the war instinct had left the herlogy with nothing. But it had all been so unnecessary, Ranson thought. The ancient outsider's brain, computing from insufficient evidence, probably gathered during a brief touchdown on Earth, had undoubtedly been able to give only a tentative appraisal of the situation. But the proto herlogy language was not constructed to accommodate ifs and maybes, and the judgments of the brain were taken as law by the herlogy. Now the Earthmen, for whom this race had deadened itself into near extinction, would complete the job, because the Herlogy had learned their mistake far too late. Ranson shook his head. There was a sickness in his stomach, a gnawing anger at the ways of history. It was capricious, cruel, senseless. It played jokes spanning millennia. Suddenly there were sounds on the stairs below him. Ranson's head jerked up and he saw five of the earthmen climbing the stairs, moving as quickly as they could from level to level, crouching momentarily at each beneath the cover of the steps. He raised one of the disintegrators, feeling the rage building up within him. There was a humming sound by his ear. The beam of one of the stunners passed by him, touching the rock wall. The wall vibrated at the touch, but the range was too great for the beam to have done it any damage. They were close enough, though, to stun Ryanson if they hit him. He dropped flat, looking for the man who had fired. In a moment he found him. A small, lean man slipped almost silently over the edge of one of the step levels and rolled quickly to cover beneath the next. He had got further than Ryanson had realized. Only three levels separated them now. He could see, from this distance in the near dark, the cruel lines of the man's face. It was a harsh, dirty face with wrinkles like seams. The man's eyes were harsh slits. Ranson had seen too many faces like that here on the edge. This was a man with a bitter hatred, looking for the chance to unleash it upon anyone who got in his way, and the enjoyment which Ranson saw gleaming in the man's eyes chilled him momentarily. In that moment, the man leaped to the next level sending off a beam which struck the wall two feet from Ryanson. He felt the stinging vibration against his body as he lay flat. Slowly he sighted the disintegrator at the top of the level under which the man had crouched for cover and waited for his next leap. Within him he felt only a bitter cold which matched the wind whipping above him. Again the man moved, but he had crept to the side of the stairs before he leaped and Ryanson's shot bit into the stone beside him as he rolled to safety. Now, only one level separated them. Further down the stairs, Ryanson saw the others moving up behind the smaller man. Still more were moving out from the outer buildings and darting to the stairs, but he had no time to hold them back. There was silence, except for the wind. And the man leaped, firing once, twice, the second beam tucked Ranson in the left wrist and spun him off balance for a moment, but he was already firing in return, rolling to one side. His third shot took the man's right shoulder off and bit into his neck. The man staggered forward two steps, trying to raise his stunner again, but suddenly it clattered to the floor and he crumpled on top of it. A pool of blood spread around him. Ranson moved back to the cover of the side wall and watched for the other men. The first one had got too near. Ranson hadn't realized how easily they could approach in this near darkness. He felt the numbness of the stunner beam spreading nearly to his shoulder. His left arm was useless. Cursing, he trained the disintegrator along the line of the steps and fired. The disintegrator cut through the stone as though it were putty, 
for a range of twenty feet. Ranson played the beam back and forth along the stairs, cutting them down to a smooth ramp, which the attackers would have to climb before they could get to him. One of them tried to leap the last few levels before Ranson could cut them, but he sliced the man in two through the chest. The separate parts of the man's body fell and rolled back to the untouched levels below. He had not had time to utter even a cry of pain. For a time now, there was complete silence in the wind. Ranson could see the inert legs of the last attacker projecting out over the edge of the third level down, and undoubtedly the others saw them too. They were hesitating now, unsure of themselves. Ranson stayed pressed to the stone wall, waiting. The wind whipped with a rising moan through the upper reaches of the building. Another of the men slipped over the edge of the massive stairs, hugging the deeper darkness at the side of the stair wall, and slowly inched his way up the newly flattened ramp. Ranson watched him coldly, through a grey haze of fury that was yet tinged with despair. What use was all this, the killing, the blood, the sweat, and pain? It disgusted him, yet by its perverse senselessness it angered him too. He cut a swath through the crawling man, through head and neck and back. A gory, shell-like hulk slid back to the foot of the ramp. And abruptly the remaining men broke and ran. One of them rose and stumbled down the steep levels of the stairs, heedless of his exposure. With a shock, Ranson saw that it was René Malholm. Another followed, and another. There were almost a dozen of them on the stairs. They all broke and ran. Ranson sent one beam after them, biting a depression into the rock wall beside them. Then they were gone. Ranson moved back from the head of the stairs and leaned wearily against the stone. His left arm was beginning to tingle with returning circulation now. He rubbed it absently with his good hand and wondered if they would try the sheer walls on the other side of the temple. He had scaled one of those ancient walls, but would they try it? Certainly they stood little chance of coming up the stairs, unless they gathered for a concerted rush. And who would lead such a suicidal attack? These men were vicious, but they valued their lives, too. Yet he couldn't watch the black walls. Leaving the stairwell unguarded would be the most dangerous course of all. In a few minutes the hand radio, forgotten on the stone floor beside him, flashed an intermittent light which caught his eye in the dusk. That would be Manning. Ranson slid the radio over to the head of the stairs and switched on there, keeping an eye on the stairway. Lee, do you hear me? I hear you. His voice was low and bitter. I'm coming in to talk. Hold your goddamn fire. Why should I, said Ranson. Because I'm bringing Mara with me. It's too bad you don't trust me, Lee. But if that's the way you want it, I won't trust you either. That's a good idea, he said, and switched off. Almost immediately he saw them come out from behind the cover of a fallen wall across the dusty street. Mara walked in front of Manning. Her head was high, her face almost expressionless. The cold wind threw dust against their legs as they crossed the open space to the base of the steps. Ranson stood motionless watching them come up. Manning still had his two stunners, but they were in his holsters. He kept behind the girl all the way, pausing before pushing her up the open ramp at the top, then moving even more closely behind her. Ranson stood with the disintegrator hanging loosely in one hand at his side. On the colonnade, Manning gripped the girl by her undamaged arm. He nodded to one of the doorways into the temple, and Ranson preceded him inside. As they entered, Manning lit a hand light and set it on the floor. The room was thrown into stark relief, the shadows of the motionless aliens striking the walls and ceiling with an almost physical harshness. Manning paused a moment to look at the herlogy and at the altar across the room. "'We can hear each other in here,' he said at last. "'What do you want?' said Ryanson. There was cool hatred in his voice, and the knife scar on his forehead was a dark snake line in the hard glare of the handlight. 
Manning shrugged a bit too quickly. He was nervous. I want you out of here, Lee, and I'm not accepting any argument this time. Ray Anson looked at Mara, staring helplessly in the older man's grip. He glanced down at the disintegrator in his hand. Manning drew one of his stunners quickly and trained it at Ray Anson's face. I said no arguments. Put the weapon down, Lee. Ray Anson couldn't take a shot at the man with Mara in front of him. He carefully laid the disintegrator on the floor. Slide it over here. Ranson kicked it across the floor. Manning bent and picked it up, returning the stunner to its holster, and held the disintegrator on him. That's better. Now we can avoid arguments, right, Lee? You've always liked peaceful settlements, haven't you? Ranson glared at him but didn't say anything. He walked slowly into the center of the room among the herlogy. They paid no attention. Lee, he's going to kill them, Mara burst out. Ranson was standing now next to the interpreter. The hand light which Manning had set on the floor across the room was trained upwards, and the interpreter was still in the darkness. He lowered his head, as if in thought, and switched on the machine with his foot. Is that true, Manning? Are you going to kill them? His voice was loud and it echoed from the walls. I can't trust them. Manning said, his voice automatically growing louder in response to Ray Anson's own. He stepped forward, pushing Mara in front of him. They're not human, Lee. You keep forgetting that for some reason. Think of it as clearing the area of hostile native animal life. That comes under the duty of a governor now, doesn't it? And what about the men outside? Did you put it that way to them? They do what I say, Manning snapped. They don't give a damn who they kill. There's going to be fighting here, whether it's against Herlogy or between the townsmen. As governor, I'd rather they took it all out on the horses here. Domestic tranquility, shall we say. He was smiling now. He had everything in control. So that's your purpose, Ranson said. There was anger in his voice, feigned or real, perhaps both. But his voice rose still higher. Is butchery your only goal in life, Manning? Manning stepped toward him again, his eyes narrowing. Butchery? It's better than no purpose at all. Lee, it'll get me off these damn outworlds eventually, if I'm a good enough butcher. And I mean to be, Lee. I mean to be. Ranson turned his back on the man in contempt and walked past Harung to the base of the ancient altar. He looked up at the eye of Kor, dim now, when not in use, he turned. Is it better, Manning? Does it give you a right to live while you slaughter the herlogy? Manning cursed under his breath and took a quick step towards Ray Anson. His hard black shadow leaped up the wall. Yes, it gives me any right I can take. It happened quickly. Manning was now beside the massive figure of the alien, Harung. In his anger, he had loosened his grip on Mara. He raised the disintegrator towards Ray Anson, and Harung's huge fist smashed it from his hand. Manning never knew what hit him. Before he had even realized that the disintegrator was gone, Harung had him. One heavy hand circled his throat, the other gripped his shoulder. The alien lifted him viciously and broke him like a stick. Ray Anson could almost hear the man's neck break, so final was that twist of the alien's hands. Harung lifted the lifeless body above his head and hurled it to the floor with such force that the man's head was stoved in and his body lay twisted and motionless where it fell. Afterwards there was silence in the room, save for the distant sound of the wind against the building outside. Harung stood looking down at the broken body at his feet, his expression as unfathomable as it had ever been. Mara stared in shocked silence at the alien. Ranson walked slowly to the mic lying beside the interpreter. He raised it. You can move quickly, old leather, when there's reason for it, he said. Harong turned his head to him and silently dipped it to one side. Ranson lifted the broken form of Manning's body and carried it out to the top of the steps leading down from the temple. Mara went with him, carrying the hand light. 
It fell harshly on Manning's crushed features as Ryanson waited atop the huge, steep stairway. The wind tore at his hair, whipping it wildly around his head, but Manning's head was caked with blood. In a moment, the men from the town came out from cover. They stood at the base of the steps, indecisive. They, too, were waiting for something. Ryanson hefted the body up over one shoulder and drew a disintegrator with the hand he had freed. Slowly, then, he descended the steps. When he had neared the bottom of the circle, the men fell back. They were uneasy and sullen, but they had seen the power of the disintegrator, and now they saw Manning's crushed body. Ranson bent and dropped the body to the ground. He looked up coldly at the ring of faces and said, One of the Herlogy did that with his hands. That's all. Just his hands. For a moment everyone stood still. Then one of the men broke from the crowd, snarling, with a heavy knife in his hand. He stopped just outside the white circle of the hand light. The knife extended before him. Ranson raised the disintegrator and trained it on him, his face frozen into a cold mask. The man stood in indecision, and from the crowd behind him another figure stepped forward. It was Malholm, and his lips were drawn back in disgust. He struck with an open hand, the side of his palm catching the man's neck behind his ear. The man fell, sprawling to the ground, and lay still. Malholm looked at him for a moment, then he turned to the man behind him. That's enough, he shouted. Enough! Angrily he looked down at the crumpled body of Manning's body. Bury him, he said. There was still no movement from the men. Malholm grabbed two of them roughly and shoved them out of the crowd. They hesitated, looking quickly from Malholm to the disintegrator in Ryanson's hand, then bent to pick up the body. It's a measure of man's eternal mercy, said Malholm acidly, that at least we bury each other. He stared at the men in the mob, and the fury in his eyes broke at them at last. Muttering, shrugging, shaking their head, they dispersed, going off in twos and threes to take cover from the wind-driven sand. Malholm turned to Ryanson and Mara, his face relaxing at last. The hard lines around his mouth softened into a rueful smile as he put his arm around Ryanson's shoulder. We can take shelter in the buildings here for the night. You could use some rest, Lee Ranson. You look like hell. And maybe I can put a temporary splint on your arm, woman. They found a nearby building where the roof had long ago fallen in, but the walls were still standing. While Malholm ministered to Mara, he did not stop talking for a moment. Ranson couldn't tell whether he was trying to keep the girl's mind off the pain, or whether he was simply unwinding his emotions. You know, i preached at these men for so many years I've got calluses in my throat. And one of these days maybe they'll know what I'm talking about so that I won't have to shout, he shrugged. Well, it would be a dull world where I didn't have a good excuse to shout. Sometimes you might ask your alien friends up there, Lee, what did they get out of choosing peace? They didn't choose it, said Ranson. Malholm grimaced. I wonder if anybody, anywhere, ever will. Maybe the outsiders did, but they're not around to tell us about it. It's an intriguing question to think about. If you don't have anything to drink, what do you do when there's nothing more to fight against or even for? He straightened up. The splint on Mara's arm was set now. He settled her back in a drift of sand as comfortably as possible. I've got another question, Ranson said. What were you doing among those men who came at me on the steps earlier? Malholm's face broke into a wide grin. That was a suicidal rush on you, Lee. A damned stupid tactic. A rush like that is only as strong as the weakest coward in it. All it takes is one man to break and run, and everybody else will run too. So it was easy for me to break it up. Ranson couldn't help chuckling at that, and once he had started, the tension that had gripped him for the past several hours found release in a full, stomach-shaking laugh. <laughs> Rene Malholm, he gasped. 
that's the kind of leadership this planet needs. Myra smiled up from where she lay. You know, she said, now that Manning is dead, I'll have to find someone else to be governor. Don't be ridiculous, said Malcolm. End of chapter 10 End of Warlord of Kor by Terry Carr